Welcome back to another episode of Ignite Agility. Today, I have Chris Herney joining me. Hello. Thanks for being here, Chris. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. It's really, really, I know I told you this offline, but it's really an honor to be here. I'm super flattered that you thought enough of the nonsense that I spew out there and uh, <laughs> <laughs> to have me on. Well, you're one of my certified scrum professional scrum master graduates. And you and I got into a conversation about what has happened to agile coaching. And I'm, you know, intentionally using scare quotes here <laughs> um, because of that. CSPSM after CSPSM candidate have said the same things that you and I were kind of going back and forth about on Twitter and subsequently in our email. And I invite everyone to say, you know, we should just record this and it would be an yeah. amazing conversation. <laughs> and they've all chickened out except you, uh. my friend. <laughs> so Chris has what we call the scrum value of courage. Yes. <laughs> and he and I are going to courageously just tackle this can of worms, the ugly truth about agile coaching. Yeah. Where should we start? Where do you start? There's so many possible places to start. Um, I, Maybe a good place to start is the story that you and I were talking about, the whole Capital One thing, right? Oh, Where right. Where all of these agile practitioners lost their jobs, and we thought – so so I had misinterpreted this story. I had thought, uh, without investigating it too much, that what had happened was Capital One said, this whole agile thing isn't working out for us. Let's scrap it. Let's get rid of all the scrum masters, product owners, coaches, so on and so forth. And you corrected me and said, no, they were actually encouraged by the progress they made with agility and decided we can go it alone now. Like, right. let's let's try to challenge ourselves and get better with what we've learned from these coaches and these training classes we've taken and all this other stuff. And, you know, I, I think that's a healthy approach. And I think that was kind of what you were implying. Like, you know, you, you hear the old, um, that kind of boil, boilerplate uh, quote, oh, an agile coach should work themselves out of a job. Well, congratulations, Capital One coaches. You did it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Isn't that so hypocritical? Yeah. Because reading the official statement that Capital One put out, they talked about getting their product people, their business people closer to their developers mm -hmm. and not having any sort of intermediary and things like that. So yeah, you're right. I've heard agile coach after agile coach. I've even said it, yeah. right? If we're doing our job right, our goal is to work ourselves out of a job. So now that it happened, look how many people are crying foul. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, well, you got what you asked for. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and you've, you've sort of drawn a line in the sand and said, this is the measure of a good coach that I can work myself out of a job and this organization can proceed along without me. And so, you know, you, you've established this sort of criteria on whether the coaching has been successful or not, and you met that criteria and now you're upset about it. Right. And it's uh, not like this is a destination. So let's say that due to attrition or, you know, natural turnover, or what have you, Capital One at some point or any other organization for that matter, loses some of its, what I would call agile, mature talent, mm -hmm. and they find the need for some sort of a coach again. That's not to yeah. say that they can't determine that there's a newer or a greener team with some of these practices and then say, hey, talented coaches, could we have you help us with this, right? Mm -hmm. And here's, it, like you say, the criteria, the measure of success uh, for this engagement. But one of the things I think that you and I were talking about, and I think I'll, I'll throw myself out there, <laughs> I did use the word guilt um, for my part in what I call the agile industrial machine <laughs> or the yes. agile industrial complex. Right. Um, because I don't know how long you've been doing this agile stuff. For me, it's my 18th year. Mm -hmm. um, so I got into this not too long after the Agile Manifesto was written. And so it, I know it makes me sound like the old lady in the community, and that's fine. I think I was lucky to have been trained by some of the people who wrote mm. the Agile 
uh, software Vel development manifesto. And so hearing those people speak firsthand, like Jeff McKenna, um, any one of those 17 gentlemen who signed the Agile Manifesto says Jeff McKenna was the first Agile coach. Mm. And they even say that this took place at the first Scrum adoption at the Easel Corporation. The joke I've heard them all say is the reason sprints were 30 days or less initially is because McKenna's contract <laughs> was written in 30-day segments. <laughs> And he was not the first scrum master. If you ever hear anybody say he was the first scrum master, he will correct you. And uh, it's out there for the world. John Skimanoltis was the first scrum master. So why a coach and a scrum master? Right. Well, McKenna was very specifically brought in for some of the programming practices, mm -hmm. for some of the team practices, whereas we look to a scrum master to be neutral. We look to a scrum master to be, you know, the coach on the framework for sure. But once that scrum master's got those reins, they don't need that coach, right. just like you were saying. And so yeah. they evaluated that in those short segments of 30, 30 days or less. And so if you're doing your job right as a coach, they should wean off or taper off. Is that similar to what you heard when you got into all this stuff? Yeah. So, so I've, I've been a agile practitioner in some shape or form since about 2008. Um, and it was purely through kind of self-education. I was managing a build and release team at a large pharmaceutical, uh, big pharma organization. And we managed all of our work via our inboxes and things got lost and it was a mess. And I just kind of fell into these ideas. I didn't know what I was doing. And I found it effective and it wasn't, it wasn't too long before I was much more interested in agility than I was interested in my actual job. And so it just sort of snowballed from there. So I would say I've been, I'll get, I guess I'll call myself an agile coach for about seven or eight years. Sometimes I feel a little uh, guilty about calling myself an agile coach because I, in the grand scheme of things, I see people like you and, and, you know, some of the signatories of the manifesto and things. And I'm like, what right do I have to call myself a coach? But at the same time, I like to think I, I help bring about good outcomes for my, for my clients and my customers. Um, and, and so, yeah, whenever I, I, I'm fortunate enough to get one of these engagements, I don't have this preconceived notion that I'm going to be treated like a full-time employee and get a pension mm. there and stay there for 20, 25 years. I'm, I'm, I'm fully expecting that it could end at any time. It could be six months, could be a year, could be two years. Um, and I just want to try to help bring about as much of an impact as I can in the, you know, the little time that I have with these folks. And, and my hope is that eventually I'll stop seeing people coming to me for these kind of canned answers that they mm -hmm. expect me to have and start, you know, looking at things more holistically using you know, systems thinking, lean principles, agile values and principles, and just start experimenting and coming up with things on their own. And when I see that, it, you know, it, it makes me happy. I, I, it also kind of triggers in my head that maybe the end is near, but right. <laughs> at the same time, it, you know, it makes me happy. Um, I think the interesting thing about agile coaches is in, I know you, you've, we follow each other on Twitter and mm -hmm. I tweet a lot and I tend to be a little bit cantankerous at times and I kind of travel in circles with other but I like that, that about also, you <laughs> but, yeah. and and so I it the irony is not lost to me that I complain all the time about how organizations you know don't get it but then at the same time I have to remind myself if these organizations just intuitively understood all this stuff why would they need me right right, so. <laughs> right? and so it sounds like you and I were around, you know, in our beginning of this journey, uh, when that was still the attitude and that was still the the same premise regarding agile coaching. Hey, if you're doing this right, you're working yourself out of a job. Yeah. It was always intended to be temporary and so on. Okay. So somewhere along the line, and I was trying to think about this before we hopped on the call, um, somewhere along the line, clients or customers or big companies started saying, well, we keep hearing about this agile coach thing. And you mentioned <laughs> systems thinking. 
And so when you think about, you know, if the organization's not really willing to change, you think about any change being introduced into a system, well, what does your body do when something is introduced that it doesn't understand, right? A virus comes in, it attacks it. (laughs) It's like, yes. you know, must, must get it out, must keep the status quo, must assimilate the system. Well, so look at what all of these big companies knew from the project management days. Yeah. You know, they wanted help or they didn't understand a title. They had uh, deals with staffing firms, staff mm-hmm. augmentation firms. Now, a lot of staff augmentation firms out there will probably get ticked off if anybody's actually even listening to this. And they'll say, well, we're a consulting firm. Yeah, you want to be. <laughs> but in the absence of actually making real change or doing real work for hire, you will slam a body into any slot for an hourly fee rather than pay to keep them on the bench. Let's be honest. Let's just be oh, honest about that. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you're you're now you're going into an area that really like gets gets my juices going, right? I see. Um, <laughs> boy, this is something that I've been quite vocal about on Twitter, on LinkedIn, in person with people. The staff augmentation industry just grossly misunderstands all agile roles, whether well, it be what scrum. They have. Or... they yeah. have armies of engagement managers, they have armies of salespeople who do nothing but work those relationships in their waterfall days, you know, Oh, you needed a project manager. You called up your friendly staff hog that was on your approved vendor list and got somebody called a project manager. So now you have these staff augmentation firms uh, with their armies of recruiters and salespeople, not knowing how to spell agile, not knowing what the heck it means and taking waterfall requisitions and slapping the word agile on them body in the slot. And then they write the engagement the only way they know how. That's right. Chris is going to be full time for 12 months with an option to extend. Because if Chris doesn't (laughs) extend, they stop making money. They stop making their margin. And so now Chris, agile coach, has been assimilated into the machine and the client only knows the way that that's supposed to work. So Chris, could you please... um, help the PMO come up with the charts and graphs for this agile thing. Could you get the templates out there to everybody? Chris, you're an agile coach, right? Yep. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Chris, we want you to be an agile coach for us. And by the way, um, here's the uh, administrator credentials to Jira. You're now that guy. Yeah. (laughs) And and it's like, absolutely not. And I didn't get it you know, quite what was happening when that first started to take hold, because my first couple, what I would call, you know, actual agile coaching engagements for me kind of went textbook, like you're saying, you know, after like 90 days, 120 days of flitting around an organization and helping everybody mature, I rolled off and, and I just knew, okay, this is the life I've chosen. This is the way I've chosen to make money. So it's my job to be looking for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Cause we all have to be, we all have to make money. Let's just be honest about that. Yeah. That's, that, that's a great point. And that's something that I've kind of, I, I was going to say I internally struggle with it, but I don't know if I actually struggle with it. So, you know, it could be day one of a new engagement for me and I'm already seeing what else is out there fielding inquiries from staff augmentation agencies. I'm already you know, keeping an eye out for the next thing because of this kind of temporary um, st- status of these these types of engagements. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, I don't want to just keep rolling from short engagement to short engagement, chasing an extra dollar to an hour. But at the same time, you know, what, what we talked about, the criteria of an agile coach for some agile coaches is to work themselves out of the role. I constantly have to be like a shark swimming through the water. I'm constantly looking for the next thing to eat, right? Um, but there's people who don't. There's yeah. people who who will say to me, well, I need to make money. So I yeah. have to take these staff augmentation jobs. Yeah. And it's like, you don't have to, you choose to. I could right. go work at Starbucks and make <laughs> make drinks, you know, make people yep. happy getting them their, their their legal caffeine, their stimulant, you know, but I choose to do something different. So the first couple times I fell into, because I'm slow to learn, uh, fell into a 
staff augmentation, agile coaching role, and I didn't get what was happening. Oh my gosh. I was so surprised at the pushback, not only from the client, you know, saying, well, why aren't you setting up the charts and graphs and being the JIRA administrator and isn't right. that what a coach does, but the staff augmentation firm, when I would try to educate them on what this really was intended to be, they wanted nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> that's like... so that, that's so funny that you say that because I you know look look I probably get and this is no exaggeration because I don't know my resume has landed in a million databases I probably get 30 to 40 emails a day for scrum master roles product owner roles business analyst roles agile coach roles all these different roles that where the director requisition... of agile yes. director <laughs> you know agile owner <laughs> Ad, agile agile delivery manager right, right. Um, and, and and so every now and then one piques my interest and I'll respond I you know I'll, I have some boilerplate responses that I give with rate and things like that and some a lot of times they'll come back and they'll say you need to be on site or the rate's too high or whatever the case may be. And like you just described, I'll try to engage in a little bit of conversation via email with these staff augmentation agencies, trying to educate them a little bit, you know, correct them a little bit. And th like you said, they want nothing to do with they it. They just cut off the it. communication because they've got a million other people that can churn through and they've probably got a million other people who will accept very low rates. Um, you know, not very advantageous circumstances. And they, you know, I think, I think a lot of these staff augmentation agencies, I think you alert, alluded to this earlier, they're just plugging bodies into holes yep. and collecting their margin. And if, and if one doesn't work out, There's they don't really, else. yeah, they don't really care so much about the fact that, oh, gee, maybe we didn't really serve our client well in this instance. They'll just plug another body in there. Right. And, and, and I'm not speaking for all staff augmentation firms, because I'm sure you and I can both come up with exceptions of ones that yeah. did, you know, pleasantly, surprisingly <laughs> did say, oh, we didn't realize we're not really serving our clients needs yeah. by just marching to the status quo. Um, and so I think one of the things, because you mentioned guilt in a different way than I was experiencing mm -hmm. it, I started to feel guilty about my part in perpetuating that. Oh yeah, me too. Me because too. there's no secret to the people who follow me of what I do for a living. Not only do I engage in short, real change coaching engagements at, with individuals, but also with companies. But then when I'm not with clients, I am teaching people Scrum, Certified Scrum Master, Advanced Scrum Mastery, and then the higher level one that you came through, Certified Scrum Professional. And so in that evolution, what I try to impose on folks is there's no better teacher than experience. Yeah. And so you've got to be a scrum master for X number of years, getting mm -hmm. the snot kicked out of you and understanding yeah. really a third of the scrum master's job is coaching the organization. Yeah. yeah. So once you've got that experience and you've come through the advanced CSM eventually the CSP like you have, now we're talking coach worthy. Yeah. Right. But I have so many people that I know personally took a CSM, they hop out on LinkedIn and they change their title to agile coach. Yeah. Poof. I'm an agile coach. I That's right. Know. Wow. <laughs> when, when have you worked on a team a day in your life yet? Well, I mean, that's the, great that you got your driver's license yeah. and you're ready to go <laughs> help people as a scrum master but you're not ready that. for nascar yet right <laughs> you're well, not what, ready for nascar yet what's what's interesting about that right is you're 100 correct i see that all the time people take a two-day course have never filled the role of scrum master or any agile role right agile related role and they change their linkedin title to agile coach at the same time there's no shortage of staff augmentation agencies who will latch on to that and present them to their clients. Yep. Hey, you wanted a CSM. Here's a CSM, Agile Coach, Presto. Uh, and then those people inevitably get into um, a role and they don't serve their clients well. It's interesting because in in kind of preparing for this conversation with you, I was doing some reading on the Agile Industrial Complex. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
people like Martin Fowler, people like Daniel Mezik, they write a lot about this topic of imposition, right? Rather than invitation. And when you get somebody like that to fill an agile role, someone who's gone through their two day CSM and that's all they've done, all they really know are rules, right? Or, or at least what they perceive are rules. And so I, the, the, the term I've heard is these people are really framework installers, right? Mm -hmm. So they come in into an organization who claims to need an agile coach and they've really got someone who loosely understands the scrum framework and is going to install it across the teams that that right. person works with, right? And they're going to say things like, like, you have to have your 15 minute meeting at this time every day and you have to have your your other events at these times of day and you have to estimate everything using story points uh i mean you know story points are not actually part of scrum but people Sometimes have they don't even know that they, they kind of attach these things to scrum yeah yeah well i'll just in a side note that's what i really appreciated about your course was that you were painfully explicit about <laughs> what i'm telling you now is part of scrum or what I'm telling you now is not part of Scrum, right? And so that was really uh, helpful to me because a lot of people don't take that kind of care. But uh, but the whole thing about the guilt, right? I'll give you, since we're talking about story points, I'll have a, a an engagement and the client will say, you need to come teach our teams how to estimate in story points using the Fibonacci series. And they don't necessarily want to have a conversation with me about what's the value of doing that. What's the potential alignment with the value, the agile values and principles? What's potential misalignment with the way you're using it? They don't want to have that. They just say, teach this team how to do it and then make sure they do it. And it's like, part yeah. of me is like, well, <laughs> I've got to pay my mortgage and that's what they're going to write me a check to do. And, <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, I have a tremendous amount of guilt, as you said, about perpetuating this agile industrial complex, this framework installation, imposition. Um, I struggle with it, to be honest yeah. with you. I struggle with it a lot. When and I, I, was... always, I always try to sneak my two cents in there. Like, you know, when I'm talking to a team about story point estimation, I, I always plan a little seed there. Do we really need to be doing this? Uh, but, you know, that doesn't always... People... Some people just naturally want to be told what to do. Here's process A, do A, and put the blinders up and don't do anything else. Yeah. When so. I was newer at this, I, I hear what you're saying. And when I did need that paycheck, I tell people all the time, I went right up to the line and then I backed off just enough to pay my mortgage, like you say, right? Just, just enough to stay employed. And then as <laughs> I got into a different position... Yep where I wasn't living paycheck to paycheck, I'd learned from my mistakes. I saw that line and I crossed it. There are times I'm just like, you know, if, if I get let go or they terminate the contract, so be it. And it got to a point where this company is uh, going on its 13th year. We fire clients. And some people hear that and think that's horrible. And mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm just honest. So we'll get to a point where the things that we talked about, you know, at the beginning of the engagement, yeah. because now nowadays Christian and I painstakingly screen the client for when you say agile, what do you even mean? And this isn't something you can install. And we're going to have a lot of conversation about, are you willing to change? And what does that mean? Yeah. And if they aren't on board, honestly, we don't want the engagement because it, it's going to not be good for us. It's not going to be good for them. Um, and we really pride ourselves on being honest with people. We're very congruent with these values, which is a bit of an antiquated notion these days. But the installers you were talking about, I just ran across one unbeknownst to me. I had a woman show up in my certified scrum master class who is actually the CEO of a small services organization. And I love that because I'm in a services organization. And she's like, can we actually use this framework? Yes, you can. But services is contextual. It's different than building software. It's different than building a physical product. So as I start doing my thing right. in the class and, and answering her questions, but from a contextual point of view, from having asked her, because like you said, imposition or invitation, 
I asked a lot of questions, inviting, you know, her to give me that context. Yeah. At the end of the call, she says, yeah. since it's just you and me, because we let everybody else, you know, say goodbye for the day and it's, it was just she and I, she said, we have an agile <laughs> coach that our staffing firm recommended. And she said the name of the person. And because it is local, Minnesota is a small, oh. small pond. She said, do you know this person? And I said, I don't know them personally. Do I know of them? Yes. And she said, but a lot of what we learned today is the opposite of what this person has told us. And I said, I am so sorry for that. Mm -hmm. I cannot speak to what another coach knows or doesn't know, but I can tell you original sources. Like you said, I was spewing out sources, right? This is from XP. This is from Scrum because I want you to yeah. own your own ideas. I want you to go read extremeprogramming.org. I want you to go That's read right. at scrumguides.org and then make up your own darn mind, right? I'm, it's not my job to tell you how to run your business or to micromanage a team. These are some ideas, but now let's talk about it. And I think a lot of these installers or a lot of these people who just want the, I don't know, is it like a status thing to call yourself an agile coach? I mean, is that, you know, they just rush to, to skip all the experience, uh, you know, it's going to make them I, better. I don't know what it is. <laughs> what, what's interesting to me is I, I always, I, it, it could be a status thing. I, you know, I, I assume it's probably a money thing that they think if by just changing their LinkedIn title to agile coach, they're suddenly can market themselves as an agile coach and command a higher hourly. Um, you know, I, I learned, I learned this concept called, uh, I want to make sure I get this right. It's, it's a logical fallacy called Maslow's hammer and what it basic, I don't know the kind of background behind who Maslow is or anything, but the, the basic concept of it is if all you're equipped with is a hammer, every single problem is going to look like a nail. Right. And so when you get these framework installers who now have changed their title to agile coach, they could come, they could enter into an organization who has lots of things going on that might be wildly inappropriate for scrum. Maybe something else is a better idea, but they don't know. They don't have that breadth of experience and knowledge, and they don't know how to treat any of any problem other than with scrum. Agile coaches who, you know, make videos and are circuit speakers and things talk about this idea of coming in and cleaning up the wreckage of the scrum people. And I don't want, scrum is a great framework. And so I want to be clear, whenever people criticize scrum, I think they're mistakenly criticizing the framework itself when the actual problem is it, the misuse of the framework. Right. Right. Um, and so it's, it's, it's interesting to hear these people talk about coming into organizations and cleaning up the mess from the scrum people um, from the, and, and I think what they're really doing is they're cleaning up the mess from these framework installers. The people who only have a hammer in their tool belt. Right. I think you, they, they uh, can't to, really address. Yeah. To, to make a really bad dad joke since you're a dad, right. <laughs> to, to, to hit the, the nail on the head. I think you did. I think it's funny. <laughs> yeah. I think because, uh, one of uh, our students I challenged because I, I know them personally and I was their CSM instructor and I knew their situation. I knew they were unemployed when they took the CSM. I knew, you know, that they were just getting their very first scrum master role right out of the class. And I was excited to help in that endeavor. But then one year later, they started calling themselves an agile coach. And when I asked, they did respond with, well, I need to make money. Well, okay, you can do a lot of things yeah. to make money. Yeah. Why be a part of what's just bastardizing this original idea? Mm. It's so it's so subverted that I stopped calling myself an agile coach. And in conversation, if somebody asks if I offer that service, I'll say yes and I have questions for you. Uh, but you know, if you look at my LinkedIn or you look at our website, I now say guide and I say mentor because the word coaching is that's just, yeah, it's just, shocking. you know, that's really interesting because, um, 
somebody that I know local to me, I'm sure you know, uh, Woody Zool, mob programming, no estimates guy. He he started calling himself a few years ago an agile guide, and I thought that was interesting and had a conversation with him. And he he, he said some of the same thing, things that you're saying, that the connotation of coach has kind of maybe bring about some uh, negative perceptions or feelings from some people. Uh, the joke I always make right now in this in this age of social media is all of a sudden everybody is crawling out of the woodwork and they're calling themselves a photographer or a makeup artist or a, a club DJ. And I think agile coaches are the same way. Totally. Um, uh, you know, or or a life coach, right? Oh, I'm an yeah. agile coach now. Even worse. <laughs> so um I agree because I, 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 I was gonna. Oh, sorry. I, I was just gonna mention real quick on the on the guilt about the perpetuation, right? Look, I, I I'll admit I suffer a lot from imposter syndrome, and I think I do a good job for my clients, and I've had clients give me positive feedback, and but still I suffer from imposter syndrome. But one of the things that I I will sort of pat myself on the back for is this. I guess it's this idea related to integrity, and. That, I've, I'm always kind of keenly aware of anything that I'm doing within an engagement with a client. Am I potentially creating a perception about agility as a whole that might contradict what the original framers of the, the Agile Manifesto intended, right? Am I helping perpetuate outcomes that kind of cause these cantankerous people on Twitter to complain about, you know, how bad agile is now and how dysfunctional it is and so on and so forth. So I'm always, you know, back to my story about the story points, right? Yeah, they're going to, they want me to teach a team story points and maybe deep down, I don't feel that story points are really the biggest fish to fry for this team. Maybe they got other problems to address and, you know, I'll be, I'll be vocal about that and I'll state it and I'll talk to them about, you know, maybe we should be concentrating on other things. Um, so, you know, I, I always, I always want, I never want to lose that kind of awareness of making sure that what I'm doing with my clients isn't perpetuating you, something, a, you broke a up, ne negative connotation. You broke up really badly when you were saying that. So what I think I'm going to have you do is just cycle your video off. Oh, sorry about it. that. Yeah, it's okay. Cycle it off. And cycle it back on. Okay. Just start, stop video. Okay, now, now turn it back on. How are we doing now? Yep. See, now you're doing great. And now just say that part about I'm always conscious of. <laughs> say that part again. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, so, oh, yeah, I, I, just, I just always want to be keenly aware of are the things I'm doing with clients, the conversations I'm having with them, the concepts I may be training or teaching, are they perpetuating the agile industrial complex, the dysfunction, the framework installation, or are they perpetuating this alignment with the agile values and principles? I maybe sometimes, but I don't consciously want to be part of perpetuating giving agile a bad name. Because I think right now we're in a kind of precarious spot where Agile in some pockets is game. And and back to my point earlier, I think people incorrectly criticize the organizational misapplication of it. Yeah, I agreed. My guilt is the the impression given in some of these classes that just get the badge and you too can do this. And as much as I try <laughs> to point out, this is just the beginning. This is not the end. This is the beginning. That's why I say it's your driver's license. You're now permitted on the street. I can't control what they do when they get out on the street, whether they rush out and get arrested for speeding or, you know, negligent driving or driving into a ditch or getting into an accident. I, I can't control any of that. But what I'm starting to see is organizations who offer coaching credentials just for sitting in a two-day class. So I think part of that, mm -hmm. you know, perpetuation of that model is what I feel guilty of. And I don't participate in any of the coaching 
credentials, especially not the companies out there that just sit in a class and poof, you're a coach. And I yeah. know that I've got some sort of impression that's being given because I get students that email me after class and say, well, I want to be an agile coach. So what class do I take? And I have to, you know, very <laughs> gently burst their bubble and explain that if you really want to do this, you got to do this. You got to get some experience under your belt. Yes. I have no formal coaching credential letters behind my name. And I'm not going to get any because no executive right. that I have taken through transformations and I have personally worked with CIOs, CEOs, fill in the blank, right? None of these people said, well, what coaching credential do you have? What spoke to them was my <laughs> references, my referenceable clients and my work. So yeah. experience is experience. So I just stopped calling myself a coach yeah. even. It's like, nope, I'm a guide and a mentor. I'll help you. I don't really care what you call me, but I am not going to give the illusion that this is a copy paste quick install. That's not what this is. So how are we going to- It's really interesting because the- Oh, sorry. I don't know if there was a delay there. I was there just was a say, delay, it's, but it's that's really okay. You can that, pick up. Um, there, there seems. Oh, okay. Uh, the, there seems to be this kind of uh, uh, just urgency for people to sort of jump immediately from. I got a, I got a CSM. I've been a Scrum Master for a couple months. I, I now want to be an Agile coach right now. It, it's kind of in contrast with more traditional idea of getting an entry level job and gaining experience over time and working your way up into something. Um, it, I don't, I don't know if it's a general, gen, uh, a generational thing. I don't know if it's just specific to this space at organizational agility, but people just really want to jump right to agile coach day one, day one, I'm a CSM mm -hmm. day two, I'm an agile coach leading an enterprise wide transformation. Right. And it's just it's it's unfortunate. You know, I was I had a question for you. I'm I'm interested mm -hmm. in this. As a as a scrum trainer and 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 here's here's my opinion on training when people work in especially people who work in large enterprises go off to take training, certified scrum master, product owner, scrum developer. They go to these courses and they spend two days with people like you and they get really full of inspiration and new ideas. And they go back to work the next day and they just get slammed right back into the status quo. As, as a trainer, do you ever worry about, I trained this person, at least implicitly, my name is attached to this person. And now they've been thrust back into this situation where they have to do dysfunctional, ineffective things. Is that ever, how do you deal with that? Oh, that, that guilt used to crush me. And I got to a point where <laughs> I had to just let it go because I can't control what that person's filter heard or didn't hear because I have heard just wacko things that people have gone back into their organizations and claim that I said <laughs> that I know for a fact I never, the, the words never came out of my mouth. <laughs> well, that trainer said, no, your filter heard it. So now I try to impress upon people in the classes. <laughs> the ego is a powerful thing, that amygdala, right? That ego, that filter, that voice that talks to you all the time. Yeah. I can't control that thing. And whatever you're choosing to do with this information, I also can't control. If people want my advice... My advice is don't go back to work and start trying to change other people. What a waste of time. The only person you can change is yourself. Because if you go back into you know, your work environment and we've been doing it all wrong and blah, 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 blah. Oh, now you just made everybody defensive. Oh, look who knows so much <laughs> coming out of a training class, <laughs> right? Ask questions. <laughs> Make observations. Yeah. Hey, I learned a thing or two at this workshop I went to. I've got some questions for us. 
why are, are we using story points? Because did you know it's our choice to do something different? You know, so those kinds of things are what I try to equip people with now. I can't go back in time when I was newer and probably gave the wrong impression. I probably have a lot of culpability in that. Like I said, the guilt <laughs> when I had that realization was kind of soul crushing. But now that I've been beat up by that a little bit, I try to make sure people understand my job for teaching is just here's some information. Here's what it is. Here's what it is not. What you do with it, that's completely your choice. Now, a mentor, a guide. It's up to you. A coach might help you, <laughs> but that's different. That's totally different yeah. than teaching. So to it's, put, it's oh, really okay. interesting that you talk about people's Sorry, it, it's interesting to me that you talk about people's filter because I, I think that confirmation bias plays a huge role in a lot of the ways that Agile can go wrong. Um, I, just make up an example, right? You pro There's lots of managers out here out there who probably feel like, I need to compare my teams and see who's the good team and who's the bad team. And then they could go to a course and they learn about burn down charts. Perfect. My agile coach told me to use burn down charts to compare my teams and pit them against one another, right? And so confirmation bias, right? We we have these, we're anchored to these ideas already, and we hear a little piece of something that might support that confirmation bias, and we just you know launch into it head on. Yeah, I I think you're right. Um, it reminds me of a organization that I I was helping, and I was engaged at the CIO level, and there were a number of people making the change and, you know, getting on board. And there was one manager who just, like you say, right, total confirmation bias because he had defined his career by office with the door, name played out front, charts and graphs and, and all those sorts of things. And so he and I were having a, a really tough one-on-one -on -one conversation. And he says, I looked agile up on the internet last night. He said, and I found all the things wrong and all the things up that tell me this will fail and this isn't a good idea for our company. <laughs> Interesting. Your boss, the CIO, asked you to get on board with making this change successful. So instead of using your right. time to look for ways to do that, your own confirmation bias in your searches, because any anything you type into Google, <laughs> anything you type, you've already you know set the stage, set the confirmation yeah. bias for the results that you're going to get. Y you chose to come up with all the ways to make it fail. Wow! Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> he was one of the people who was invited to leave the organization as part of this change, and then he was pissed and shocked and didn't understand why. And so I yeah. think it really comes down to the choices everybody makes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny that, um, you know, the crux of agility is, it, it is acknowledging, look, you're in a, you're in a complex, uncertain, volatile domain and you need to, you need to be aware of your environment and getting feedback from your environment and adapting to that. But at the same time, you have people who treat agility, and you alluded to this earlier, like it's something that I can just pull off the shelf and install. Like it's a server I can plug into the wall and instantly we're agile. And it's that's one of the biggest kind of confirmation biases that I see, right, is, is people people in leadership roles, especially at large enterprises. And that's typically kind of where I live in, in, in the large enterprise space. Um, people in leadership roles who just innately believe that an agile transformation is swapping out our old processes and swapping in these new processes, or even worse, keeping our old processes and giving them new names. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. It's it's difficult to it's difficult to deal with or or 
I don't know, convince. Uh, Diana Larson always says I'm not in the convincing business, and I, and I kind of like that. I've kind of la latched onto that idea. It's not really, I don't want to go and lecture people and say this is what you need to do because I'm so smart and I'm here to save the day. But it's difficult to lead people to that kind of mindset change where I can no longer just follow best practices and pre-derived canned processes. I now need to embrace emergent practices based on kind of probing and experimenting and getting feedback. Um, it, it, to me, that's the, just the biggest hurdle, right? And that's, I think that's where confirmation bias really comes into play. They, people, people just want to hear something from this, from this agile space and make a one-to-one -one correlation with something they already know very right. well from their traditional PMP days and things like that. And that, right. those one-to-one -one correlations just don't exist quite often. Exactly. So to put a bow on this, <laughs> if there is an aspiring Agile coach listening who might be thinking, well, thanks, Angela and Chris, for crushing my dreams or, you know, <laughs> peeing in my punch bowl, um, what advice would you have for anybody out there right now who says, yes, and I do want to be an agile coach in the way that Angela and Chris talked about it at the beginning of this, this conversation. Well, I, I think you already said it, right. The, the first, the way to go about getting there is to, to get experience. But what I would say is I would urge people to, to view if you're viewing agile coach as a career path to view it with some, some integrity and want have a desire, want to be a good, effective agile coach. Don't don't set your don't set your goal as I just want to be an agile coach and make agile coach money. And by the way, let's not perpetuate the idea that agile coaches are millionaires, right? Because that's We're not so not true. I drive and, a Ford, not a yeah. Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, and so, uh, you know, have some place some integrity on the on the the profession, uh, for lack of a better term, want to be a good agile coach, want to bring about good outcomes for your clients, for your employers, whatever the case may be. Uh, and the best way to do that is, like you said, get some experience. I'll, I'll just give you a little, my, my story, right? I, I was, I don't know, I was a scrum master and I worked for a couple of different organizations. And just, just through a connection from a previous employer who I apparently had left a good impression with, uh, this person brought me in to be the scrum master for many teams, like six teams, which I don't advocate, by the way. <laughs> but I'm just <laughs> saying that's what they asked me to do. And I was naive enough to think, yeah, I can do this, no problem. And it was a problem. But anyway, the, the overall, it was a small organization. They had six teams. That's all they had. I was the scrum master for six teams. So my... The, the work I did with them and the attention I gave them started to kind of transcend single teams and, and was more like a, like an enterprise level thing or a company wide thing. And it start after a while, it started to dawn on me that I'm, I'm not only scrum mastering for individual teams and coaching individual teams, but I'm providing a lot of outward coaching to the broader organization, to leadership and so on and so forth. And I, I got some experience doing that. And then it just kind of very gradually snowballed into more and more responsibility with different clients, bigger clients, until I got to a point where I felt comfortable referring to myself as an agile coach, referring to myself as someone who has the competence to deal with enterprise level transformation and coaching and so on and so forth. So I don't think there's any magic um, pill that you can swallow that will replace experience. You have to, you have to get the experience. And if my story is, is any inspiration, maybe you can find an opportunity where you can start small and have room to grow into that. Nice. Well said. I, 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 I don't, I wouldn't advocate anybody. I, I wouldn't advocate for anybody being a scrum master for a single team, quitting their job and then going, getting a job with IBM as an enterprise <laughs> transformation coach. Right. Well, That's not going to work out well for you. They, so. they, they may uh, be using a different 
thing that has the word agile in it, which is a different topic for a different day, since you know where where the origins yeah. of, of, <laughs> and of I, what IBM and I just created. Said, and I just said IBM because that was the first really big. <laughs> and and I just said IBM because that was the first big company that came to mind, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, thanks so much for joining me today, Chris. This has been awesome. You want to say anything? Thanks so close? much. It was really fun. <laughs> Let's it was do really that again. Let's do that be... part again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do the closing okay. again. Thanks so much for joining me today, Chris. This has been awesome. Okay. Are you going to say something Thank other than okay? Thank you so much. It's been really fun. It's been an honor to be here. <laughs> we'll make Rand put that all together. Oh, can you can you not hear me? <laughs>